series of the Magnus. We bring together scholars, presenters, and objects from the Magnus collection into each other's life. I assume if everybody came here today, you already know what a bar mitzvah is, but uh, you're in for a treat in discovering and in many uh, different ways and destinations around the Bay Area and beyond. So, uh, Fisher Muno and Coach Fisher are our presenters today. Uh, professor in, in, the, in sociology at UC Berkeley and the Stig Scholar in Jewish Studies, respectively, uh, uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, we display objects that uh, range in the Californian Jewish experience from 1908 to very near present. Uh, the silver objects you see in the case that we are displaying today are Torah Penios that were dedicated in 1908. Uh, by a bar mitzvah, by a, a young man who became bar mitzvah, in, and were a gift to Congregation Sheriff Israel in San Francisco. And uh, there was a, we were trying to estimate a date of 19, the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s, for a, 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 a cake popping, a cake decoration for a, a bar mitzvah party. And all kinds of, uh, these days they would say swap, right? But uh, invitations, cards, and and, and, and mementos from different bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah ceremonies. Um, that sort of complements uh, today's presentation. We're delighted to have you here. We, we sort of formally launched the, the pop-up exhibition series for this semester. Uh, about coming of age, this is the third year that we present every week during the fall and, and spring semesters these types of talks that combine presenters and, and objects. And we mine the, the treasures of the Magnus Collection to do so, and the amazing intellectual capital of our community and our, our campus. So please join me in welcoming our, our speakers today, and enjoy this, and stay tuned for the coming events that will resume in October. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. I'm Claude Fisher, Professor of Sociology here, and a member of the board of the Center for Jewish Studies. This is an event of the Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, is a topic that is so central in American Jewish life and is so fraught. But actually, we don't know very much systematically as scholars about the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah. We have now, thanks to this new book by Patricia, Patricia Monroe, we're learning a lot more about it. Uh, Patricia was originally a student and uh, came to Jewish studies and sociology through her work as a leader in her own congregation. Her academic interests began with questions of how minority Jewish populations negotiate with dominant populations, leading to her study of the Passover Haggadah and the Jews of Hellenistic Egypt, before she turned to sociology and did her dissertation on the Bar and Bat Mitzvah experience in contemporary Northern California. So the book that we're going to be discussing is unprecedented in terms of the study of this very central ritual in American Jewish life. It involved Patricia doing interviews with over 100 professionals in synagogues throughout the Bay Area, including over 40 rabbis. On top of that, she did on-site observations at five very different synagogues, attending the services, uh, uh, watching how the bar apartments for kids got prepared, interviewing the parents and the children about the experience and what they felt about it and how they were going through it. So the plan for this uh, rest of this hour is that I will post some questions to Patricia about the Bar Robotnitz experience as she's learned about it, uh, both historically, but especially through her field work here in the Bay Area. And we will leave time for uh, members of the audience to ask their own questions about this very central and yet very emotionally charged part of American Jewish life. So with that, let me start by asking uh, Patricia, where did this bar mitzvah come from? Uh, my limited knowledge of Torah is no figure in the Torah ever gets bar mitzvah. And yet, it seems like every Jewish kid in the 21st century is at least supposed to get bar mitzvah. So where did this thing come from? Well, let me start actually by thanking the Madness, thanking the Center for Jewish Studies, and thanking you, Claude, for um, helping make this possible. I'm really glad to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, with that, um, where did it come from? Well, no, it's not mentioned in Torah, um, but it is. But texts are cited. So the one that I keep referring back to because it gets referred, I get told about it, is Pirkei Avot, uh, which has in um, uh, one of the chapters cites 
At five years old, you recite the Bible. At 10, Mishnah. At 13, you're responsible for mitzvot. And it goes on for 15 different items. Well, so the real question is, why is it that the age of 13 is picked on at this time and in this place? And the answer that, so those words are used to give the ritual authority, but the reality is, is that the bar mat mitzvah became a way to negotiate uh, with modern life. So that if my child had a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, um, I'm demonstrating that I've raised a Jewish child. I have fulfilled my familial obligations as a Jew, and I have to some degree fulfilled my family obligations. Um, this is important in a society uh, it, it, where individual choice matters, so that um, children very frequently would tell me as I was interviewing them, I had the choice. My parents gave me the choice. Of course, I knew what they wanted. This wasn't quite the way they phrased it. But I made the decision on my own. Um, so the bar mitzvah becomes a way of choosing to do what everybody wants them to do. From the, fat, from the congregation's point of view, it does something else. Congregation's Jewish leadership is very concerned with Jewish community surviving and thriving. So it's not a familiar thing, it's a community thing. The goals do not, for, for the, the leadership, don't make um, the family, it, it's not a goal in and of itself, it's a means to creating knowledgeable Jews for the future. So where for the family, it's a way of demonstrating having accomplished raising this child for the uh, community, it's a way, and the, the leadership, it's a way of perpetuating Judaism. This leads to what I, what, uh, I, I call the bar mitzvah bargain, but actually Stuart Schoenfeld first brought it to forward, and it's the negotiation between how the different parties get what they want out of that. So, so if I understand the bargain, the bargain is the family gets a certified Jewish child, community gets a, the professionals get to teach Judaism to those children. Yep. And more and more to the families as well. To the families as well. Yeah. So the, the bar mitzvah that comes, uh, develops in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century, mm -hmm. and some of us of age can remember the bar mitzvah, the bar mitzvah of uh, mid 20th century. But it must be constantly in flux. So what are the sort of things that have been studied in the 21st century that the bar mitzvah looks like that's perhaps new and different than uh, those of us who remember baking at home. <laughs> well, the bar mitzvah of the 21st century has several different tasks that the child typically uh, uh, fulfills. Some of them do actually go back quite a ways, and those would include uh, giving a Devar Torah. Uh, it would include leading some of the service, uh, whether that be one or two prayers or the entire thing. Uh, it includes chanting texts, uh, Torah and Haftarah. Um, I've heard of some cases, it's a moving target a little bit, so I've heard of some cases where Haftarah is becoming optional um, and Torah is becoming larger, but the, the shape of each of these varies quite a bit, how long the Bar Torah is and so on. What's really shaped uh, the, the bar mitzvah of the 21st century are the events of the last century, the last half of the last century, and the two most important uh, ev events are uh, the growth of egalitarianism, uh, specifically uh, feminism, but more and more other uh, other forms of egalitarianism as well we're seeing, um, include other ways of including groups which have previously not been included. So, but let's let's stick with feminism. That's that's really what I deal with in the book is how do you include women, um, and then the second and absolutely huge is uh, the rise of intermarriage. So particularly in liberal congregations, uh, intermarried families make up well over half of the congregation, somewhere between 40 and 70 percent, but, but it's, it's, it's a rate that is not shrinking. And the result is that those congregations have to find ways to both continue a Jewish, very Jewish ritual and service, because the issue evolves from the service itself, um, and also include these groups in ways that make them feel respected. It's a difficult balancing act. Does that answer the question? Okay.
think we may have had some of these tensions about uh, intermarried couples, intermarried parents, and uh, feminism. So, but the, a lot of the big question is, uh, you spend a lot of time with the families and the children and the educators who are responsible for guiding these kids to the government school. And it, there seems to be a lot of emotional <coughs> stuff that goes around the bar about mitzvah. Um, and it probably starts years before the event itself. Family conflict, family uh, issues, family pride, right? thrills, uh, chills. What, what's, where's, where's all this emotional stuff coming? So why is it such a big deal? If going back to that question, why do, why do people care so much? Uh, it has to do with the investment in the meaning. I mentioned one, which was this idea that I've successfully raised a child, but there's actually, you can look at four, pretty, four specific meanings evolved from just listening to what people had to say. Um, first, and most literally, and I heard this from virtually every rabbi I interviewed was all it means is that you've turned 13 or 12. That's all it means. And the kids pick this up as well. So um, one of the quotes that I really liked was, was from, uh, this is a, a Orthodox bat mitzvah. Don't mess up. I mean, you can mess up. Really, there's no successful or non-successful. All you do is wake up in your bat mitzvah. Congratulations. Now, you'll notice that there's at least two different meanings that this young woman has incorporated. One is, I better not mess up. And that was the first thing she said. Um, and then the second one was, oh, and by the way, when I wake up in the morning at 12, I'm, I'm a bat mitzvah, so... It doesn't mean so. So there's there's different meanings that are encoded in in this. Um, what children in, uh, seem to understand this change of status as meaning is that they actually have more responsibility. Um, another meaning is the one about affirming this Jewish identity, and that's the one that led to the bar mitzvah the bargain. Um, this young woman also referred to a third one, which is being successful. Children are given difficult tasks in some way or another. And actually, one of the other things that's happened uh, as we move into the 21st century is how those tasks are defined can vary. So the mitzvah project, which I didn't actually deal with in the book, probably should have, has become almost universal as a way to define part of what it means to be Jewish. And to accomplish that successfully is, is part of the process. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's because doing something successfully, doing it Jewishly matters. Um, and finally, parties get a really bad rap. But in fact, celebrating, and I didn't look at the parties, but celebrating the accomplishment and celebrating the fact that this child has done something and has moved into a new status is part of what all rituals do, all, all, all uh, life cycle rituals do. And so understanding and moving towards an acceptance of that is part of what uh, is this another meaning. All of that's pretty fraught. And so, is it surprising it's, it's emotional? I don't think so. So you, you must be uh, witness to many uh, tension between the parents and the children. Do you have any uh, interesting examples of uh, kind of, there's a negotiation between the families and the Jewish professionals, and there's, there's a lot of negotiation between the parents and the children. So this is an interesting question. So in fact, in the research itself, um, because of the way I, I did it, I didn't witness negotiations between the parents and the children. I did witness them between the tutors and the children pretty extensively. I saw, I, I, I watched a number of tutors with, with the students. Um, I watched preparation for bar mitzvah. And then when the parents and the children talked to me, they alluded to tension. So every parent and every child talked about the problem in one way or another. Um, they talked about the fact, uh, one parent talked about the fact that the child would go into the bedroom and they had no idea what she was doing and they would nag and they would nag and they would nag. Um, but the sense was nothing was happening. Um, the re and, and in fact, this is, this seems to be the norm. Um, much more so than, than, in addition to the arguments. The result though is that, again, almost every parent said, when they got up there, my proudest moment was, watching them read. I had no idea they could do this stuff. So, I 
don't know if that's a good answer to the question, but yeah. <laughs> so it leads me to another question that we discussed, which is that uh, there's all this worry about uh, whether the child will perform well, and yet somehow, whatever the level of the child's preparation and so forth, it seems like the community and the family find almost 100% of these farm offices. Maybe the Jewish professionals don't. But at least the, the wider community and the families find almost 100% of farm offices as having wonderful, successful, you know, worthy of celebrating a big party. How does that happen, given how the wide, wide range of actual skills of these children? Because it's not all about the skills. But in all that, they always also are successful. Um, OK, so let me say more about that. First of all, all those four meanings um, that I, I listed, if you can't find one of those meanings to fit your definition of success, you're not trying hard enough. So, the, so some of the children who uh, clearly uh, were not as successful at completing that Jewish task talked about how really what happens on the Bema isn't, it isn't the, their definition of success. They define success as having their families present and celebrating with their families and, and entering that new status within the family. They don't express it using those words, obviously. Um, so that's part of it, is that because it has this multiplicity of meanings, families can find a way to, to, to make it work. However, at the event itself, this bar buttons that takes place almost always on a Saturday morning. This is a regular service. It's structured around the regular service, within the regular service, and both as a regular Shabbat morning service and as a peak ritual, there's an enormous stake for having the ritual performance be successful. And so in that sense, the leadership works extremely hard to make sure that takes place. And they do that first by preparing the student um, the, through, through tutoring and, and so on, through um, the rehearsals beforehand, and then in the moment, rabbis and tutors or gabbis are prepared to step in and help the student. So if the student makes a mistake reading Torah, the rabbi's there. And yes, we've all been to bar mitzvahs where every other word is being fed by the tutor. Nevertheless, the ritual form is being completed in one way or another. And those students probably will not pick the completing a Jewish task success, successfully as their definition. Um, but there's an, an enormous structure to make sure that the ritual appears to be successful. I want to make it clear that when I say appear, when I say performance, I'm, I'm not taking these things lightly. Uh, it really does mean something. And that performance, that ritual performance, does affect people really deeply. Still, making it happen is important as well. You know, that, that brings up another related issue, which uh, one way to phrase this question, whose shul is it anyway? Mm -hmm. um, and I've had conversations with rabbis about this. So um, in one respect, the synagogue is a place for a regular, uh, at least on Saturday morning, the regular uh, Shabbat uh, um, uh, services. And then it is periodically uh, a place for where somehow it's dominated by the family and the family's extended kin friends and their business partners and so forth and so on. So I'm sure you, you cover, you discuss with the Jewish professionals very often this kind of issue. So could you describe the, how this tension between the two ways in which the synagogue is used work out and what kinds of <laughs> solutions to that? What are the tensions and what kind of solutions have worked out? Okay, so let me, I want to back up a bit because this is not obvious. Uh, at, at all. Uh, first of all, the way you frame it only describes one form of the problem. So, um, so I'm going to back up to um, how to, to two different models for how synagogues work. Um, and one is the one followed by the form uh, renewal um, reconstructionist models in which the primary service for the congregation takes place on a Friday night, and I'm gonna, I, I call those contemporary um, services partly because that's what the way the congregation uh, describe them. 
themselves. Um, the second is that by uh, the, the, the form used by conservative and orthodox congregations in which the Saturday morning service is the primary service. Um, and again, that's typically the, 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 the language that's, that comes out of the, the groups themselves. Uh, and we can argue about that. I've actually had arguments about that, but accepted for the time being. Um, in the first case, which is not the one you talked about, it's, it's a, a separate problem. The problem is that you don't have an argument to take place because the community has showed up on Friday night. And so that leaves a very small or non-existent service on Saturday morning. Well, sure, fine. So why not have a bar mitzvah show up there? Um, this is something that reform and, and other uh, denominations have have worked to fight because the sense there is that you've got, it really does lead to an extreme privatization. You have a private event. Why do you have a private event? Well, it's actually not because of the families. It's actually because this is the nature of that particular model for synagogue life. Um, the second problem is the one that you talked about, which is where, yeah, you do have a group of people, large, but this is where the regular community comes. When you bring in a second group, somehow that has to be negotiated. Um, and that happens in a number of different ways, um, which I'll get to in a minute. Before that, though, there's, a, there's another element that's rarely looked at. It's just assumed. And that is the dimension of size. If you have 10 bar bat mitzvahs in a year, it becomes a chance for the community to come together. If you have 60 bar bat mitzvahs in a year, it's a very different story. It's very, very difficult in that situation to keep the bar mitzvah from becoming just one damn ritual after another uh, for the congregation, obviously not for the family. Um, and so managing that situation becomes very difficult. Um, I want to speak to the case where you have about 20 in a year, because that's where you actually see um, the most, the, the place where the, what the congregation does can make the most difference. Um, and where that happens is where all groups manage to be taken into account, where there is a place for the, for the child to enact this ritual and where the family feels welcomed but where the congregation has carved out a role where they participate in the service because most, in most of these congregations, <laughs> uh, the congregation leads part of, part of the service um, and expects this to feel uh, as, as their re regular routine in some way, um, but also feels like they have a role in participating in the service itself, the, 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 the bar by the service itself. Um, so, for example, at one congregation, uh, the bar, the bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah student leads a discussion, which in which the rabbi uh, is also present and and, just, and uh, contributes, so that the, the the student has a chance to show off a little bit in a fairly sophisticated way, but the congregation and the congregation has a part because their questions and their participation are needed and the rabbi is guiding it. Another way that this can take place is that the student gives a little drosh, the rabbi picks up on that and gives a much more in-depth drosh. Um, yeah, so. So, there, so the, the first model is basically uh, Saturday morning is for a string of family events and because the, the congregation is organized itself for Friday nights to be the, the, the important community event. It's, the, it's these other synagogues right. where this possible tension can arise. Right, but and, and let me say that if the if the reform and similar congregations want to make a change, they have to make a change within the culture of the congregations, and then those congregations will face the same problem as the conservative Orthodox congregations. So, so speaking of tensions, um, you mentioned that one of the big changes in the 20, late 20th and early 21st century is intermarriage. So increasingly, um, congregations, rabbis, when rabbis face uh, a child who's uh, going to be bar bat mitzvah, one parent of whom is not Jewish, has not converted, this is a stage of mixed marriage. Um, how are the congregations and rabbis that you've, you've 
to study here in the Bay Area? What kinds of ways have they been working that out? Well, there's, they do this in a number of ways. And um, I, I want to back up a little bit by just talking about the role of intermarried families within congregational life. Because um, in many, many cases, what happens is these intermarried families are integrated fully into congregational life. So the non-Jewish parent might participate uh, with the Jewish, with the whole family for an event. Um, they might come to services um, in my congregation. I, I wasn't looking for this specifically with the research, but it's going to be there. I, uh, I see uh, non-Jewish family members singing the prayers right along with everybody else. So in that case, you have a place where these non-Jewish par parents are participating, they are working to raise Jewish children, and they are doing it in a supportive way. One of the most interesting comments I got was from a non-Jewish uh, father uh, at a Reformed congregation who explained to me that he was very concerned that he wasn't going to do a good enough job for his daughter. He wasn't going to know enough, he wasn't going to be able to be supportive enough, and he didn't want to mess it up for her. And he made a point of going to services every Saturday morning to make sure he understood exactly what was going on and what his role was. We should be so lucky with the Jewish parents. <laughs> um, but, but the difference was he was very clear that he was not Jewish. It was not, he wasn't doing this to be part of the community. Uh, he wasn't doing this to have a ritual role, per se. He was doing this because it was his job as a parent to make sure his family and his daughter were supported. So that's sort of the background for then what happens on the bima. And on the bima, this is the control pretty much of the rabbi. And rabbis make a range of decisions. So, for example, at one reform congregation, the rabbi, they're passing the Torah takes place. Um, that's a whole other thing we could talk about, but not right now. Um, and the rabbi makes allows, in fact, encourages the non-Jewish parent to pass the Torah to the child because that rabbi says this, this would not have taken place without that parent. This, this, this parent's role is extremely important. That's one extreme. The Jewish parent isn't allowed to even be up on the bima. Somewhere in the middle is the non-Jewish parent might be there, um, but not participating. What I found, which was really interesting, uh, it is that both with intermarriage and um, with uh, well, with intermarriage in particular, the lines seem to come down around reading sacred this, reading Hebrew as a sacred language. So not uh, non-Jews typically did not almost never. There's only one case, and I think it was an accident, where a non-Jew read from Torah. It's reserved for Jews. Uh, similarly, leading Jewish prayers, reserved for Jews. Um, lines that refer to the distinctiveness of the Jewish people, reserved for Jews. These seem to be lines that are fairly clear and fairly, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to predict for the future because that's a mistake, um, but right now, those lines seem to be clear. It's a, an area of leading something that's distinctively Jewish or talking about what it means to be a Jew, what, what the responsibilities of being a Jew are. Those things are reserved for Jews. Non-Jewish parents, non-Jewish relatives are included as much as possible while respecting those, those lines. Okay. So you know, the, the other part of that sort of modern dilemmas or issues you talk about was feminism. And this presumably is really an issue that has been uh, uh, handled by reform in many conservative congregations uh, by now. There's understandings about it, but it's probably a real tension in the Orthodox community. So and I know you wrote about uh, in your book how the Orthodox synagogue that you studied uh, handled the sort of rising level of feminism yeah. among their young people. Right. So. This actually, I handle this in the same chapter that I deal with with intermarriage because really the issue is similar. It's how do you both, preserve, again, preserve the Jewish nature of 
the ritual, and include groups that have been previously uh, not included. Um, and so I, I want to say one thing though that was interesting is you can you can see what seems to be the key of what it means to be Jewish to the Jewish folk to the to, to, to lay Jews by the fact that this is where everybody's putting their effort. It's, it's not in how you observe Shabbat uh, and, and or or that's actually not a good example. It's it, it's not in a lot of other areas. It's in I want my child to read Torah. Why Torah? Because Torah is where it, it, it's the dominant place where all the Jewish the Jewish narrative comes from. Laws, stories. It's the heart of Judaism. And so it's not too surprising, but it's worth noting that girls want a piece of this as well. It becomes a problem in uh, a, a place where you have uh, strict role divisions. How, how modern Orthodox, so one way to, to resolve it is the girls have a party on the Sunday afterwards, and that's what's done um, in very, very strict Orthodox families. In modern Orthodox families, I want to say Haredi, but I'm not actually sure about that. Um, what's done in modern, modern Orthodox synagogues in the Bay Area, there's, there's at least two models. Um, one is women go off to one place, men go off to another, and the women have uh, their own minion and enact the service. Uh, the second one, and this was what I, what I did observe, was the girls, you have the, the, the morning service, um, enacted by entirely by men, men on one side, women on the other. Uh, the girl gets up and she gives uh, some kind of a talk, and at the synagogue, those talks could range from a 20 minute or a 30 minute uh, Bar Torah to a similar length or even longer shiur on a particular subject of. Of, of Jewish interest. So, for example, um, one girl spoke about the uh, laws around pork. Um, go have Kiddush lunch, come back, and then the women own the sanctuary and the men go off somewhere else while the women do minha. And the girl leads the entire minha service and reads Torah. What's interesting here is that, uh, again, because of the, of the um, the nature of the Torah blessing, and because women are not commanded to read from Torah, the Torah blessings change somewhat, and I can't quote them for you, but it was not, there were changes that were as a result, again, of walking this fine line um, between what's allowed and what's not allowed within the gender roles. By the way, the difference between this and intermarriage is that there was no question that these young women were Jewish. The question was, what, given that they're Jewish, is their role. This is just, this is a, a place of real difference between that and intermarried, where the non-Jewish partner was the support person, but not making a claim to being Jewish. So do you want to, do you think what's happening in the Orthodox community around this is moving a certain direction, or, or, or sort of, they've reached a limit of what they can concede to modern feminism? I am not going to begin to speculate. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, I'm up just observing here. Okay, all right, no predictions. So uh, I think, uh, I hope you've all gotten the flavor. It was a very rich uh, description uh, of uh, the Bar uh, uh experience uh, in the cutting edge community, North, Northern California cutting edge communities. Again, there's a lot of detail in the book about uh, uh, how it feels at the grass roots, the interaction between rabbi and student and tutors and so forth, and, and what the negotiations of parents and children, families and rabbis. Um, what I want to do now for the rest of our period is, is field a few questions uh, that you might have uh, for Patricia and, uh, and, uh, and help uh, move the conversation in further directions. I see a hand back there, if you would speak up loudly. Getting back to the child who said, I wake up at age 12 or 13, I'm not saying this in any way, meaning the ritual and ceremony isn't necessary, technically. In your interviews with the parents, were there Jewish parents who didn't have the ceremony and the ritual, and yet wanted their, by definition, wanted their children uh, to have it? And, uh, 
So how did they feel about that they didn't, people who didn't have the ritual, but obviously technically became the yeah. Let me repeat this from the videotape. Uh, the question is about the issue. You, your bar mitzvah, if you just uh, wake up on your 13th birthday, but were there parents who themselves had not gone through the ritual, felt, had feelings that their children should go through the ritual? Absolutely. Uh, and that was actually very interesting. Um, where this came up, and I'm trying to remember if this was true for uh, men, uh, and, and I, I'm not remembering that, honestly. I'm, I'm fairly sure it was the case. Um, but what was the case was that there were men, this was a case of, of where he, the feminism showed up for, for women. Um, within egalitarian synagogues, uh, meaning everything but orthodox, uh, participation between girls and boys was completely normalized. Um, but that wasn't the case for their parents, either uh, men or women. Um, there was a strong sense that this was really important, that entering in to full adult Judaism and full participation was especially important for their daughters. Um, if they had not had the, the, the case, or if their sisters had not had, had a, a bat mitzvah. Um, so the sense that you wake up on a day and you, you suddenly are having a new status, everybody gave lip service to it. And nobody, nobody, including the rabbis who told me this again and again, actually acted as if that were, were sufficient. Um, so, does that answer the question sufficiently? Yes, you uh, especially emphasized uh, the girls. What about uh, the men who, the fathers, what about the did fathers? not have the ceremony and yet they won in their... That was much less the case. Almost all of the fathers had had bar mitzvahs. Um, I, I, but I, I guess where that shows up is when they talked about why it was important for their children to have it, um, they really did have a sense that this was a point of entry into the Jewish people. So it was something that they felt, whether, whether they really thought it was, I had one parent who said, you know, I can't understand the Hebrew, I don't, it seems pretty meaningless, but it matters to me, but, and this was different than what the kid said, by the way, um, but it matters to me that my kid go through the process because it's a ritual that's going to mean that he has a part of the Jewish people in a different way. And I don't want him to feel it's, it's, he doesn't have it. My takeaway from, from all the interviews is, because one of the questions is, so does having a bar mitzvah, having a bar mitzvah matter to making you Jewish in the future? How does it matter to continuity? And this is really at the heart of everyone's question. Um, and my answer would be, it's not sufficient. But it is really important for make for for it is it is necessary in a way for making young people and then eventually older people and adults feel like they are integrated into the piece. It's it's a, it's a necessary piece of, 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 of it's a necessary rite of passage, and I got that whether or not they had the, the uh, uh, gone through it themselves or not. Good question. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the beginning. Well, 
there's coincidences and coincidences and coincidences. <laughs> so one of the reasons I like to go to that quote by Pierre Kao Vogt um, is that, and I, uh, let me see if I, I actually didn't quote the whole thing, but there's 15 different moments. And I know this is in Torah, but I'm getting back there, don't worry. Um, at five years old for Bible, or for, for Torah, at 10 for Mishnah, at 13 Mitzvot, at 15 Talmud, at 18 wedding, at 20 career, uh, at 30 authority, at 40 understanding, and so on and so forth, all the way to 100 when you might as well be dead. And it literally says that. Um, so the question isn't, I think, wow, look at that, Ishmael was circumcised at 13. It's, wow, look, we're noting that moment because we have this event that it takes place at 13 that we want to go. So I think there's a whole lot of reading back. I think that we grab Pirkei, that particular moment out of Pirkei Avot because it suits our needs for the moment. I think we then grab that moment with Ishmael because it suits our moment. Um, and so on. Other questions? Uh, yeah, George? Vicky. I'm wondering if we have uh, data on the proportion of intermarried Jews who have their children bar or bat mitzvah. So the question, the question is, do we have data on what proportion of intermarried uh, couples have their children bar or bat mitzvah in the United States? Well, I could probably figure that out, and honestly, I haven't done that. But let me explain how I would go about doing that. Um, so uh, one question would be, you know, we, we know that intermarried families affiliate less than uh, 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 non-intermarried families. So first, what you might do is you might, and, and we also know, and this actually makes it difficult, we also know that the rise of independent bar bat mitzvah, the uh, independent bar bat mitzvah is on the rise. Um, I'm sorry. So this means taking place outside of the con outside of a congregation, taking place with the tutor, taking place with you know. That wasn't my interest when I, I did this. I was interested in what happened within the congregation. So so I left those alone. Um, what you would then do is take a look at uh, what at, at what the proportion of intermarried families in the congregation is, and virtually every one who joins a congregation with a child has their child come, be, become bar mitzvah. I think it's a myth to say that they join because of the bar mitzvah, but the bar mitzvah is certainly normed within that. And so I think you could then figure it out from there. I didn't do that work. I could do that work. It's actually a really interesting question. I might now do that work. <laughs> so, somebody's over there as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, we'll be here. Yeah. Uh, in your, in your uh, survey of the Bay Area, which seems very extensive, and following through on the idea of inclusiveness including women, uh, including intermarried families, did you encounter or speak with or work with any families, rabbis, or kids, uh, who, uh, rabbis or families that were dealing with kids with special needs? So the question is, uh, what about the rabbis and congregations and families dealing with kids with special needs? I asked about I, I asked the question about special needs uh, as part of my questions to the leadership, and I was told about the programs that um, the con some congregations had. Um, I have to say the work was done a little bit ahead of you know, within the last five years or so. The there's been a real uh, a rise of inclusion of, of kids with special needs. This work took place a little before that. Um, so I didn't particularly seek those families out, and the, none of the ones I interviewed were in that that model. Um, it was clear that those family, that those congregations, you know, that there's four or five congregations particularly spoke about uh, how proud they were of their inclusive, uh, of including children with special needs. We'll take one more question. I think. Way back there. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but some people do get uh, bar or bat mitzvah even though they're older than the age of 13. And did you do any, or find any research about, uh, about that? So the question is about uh, people who get bar or mitzvah beyond the age of 13, and, and what can you say about people like that? Well, I'm one of them, so <laughs> there's that. Um, the answer is 
Yes, there's there's some work on that. It's actually interesting. There's uh, the point that I started. It looked to me like there might have been more work on the adult bar bot mitzvah than on the bar bot mitzvah 13. Um, oddly enough, um, but it wasn't part of the work that I did because it's a it's a very different process. What you're looking at with uh, the, the bar mitzvah 13, bot mitzvah 13, 12 or 13, is a whole family process where the family is integrated into the congregation. What I was interested in looking at was how that whole all works, how the congregation, the congregants, the leadership, the families, the kid, that whole process works together to make this event happen. Um, adults come to it as individuals. Congregations then support them um, as part of adult programming. But it's a very different process, and so I didn't, I didn't look at it within the context of this work. Okay, well, we've reached the end of the period. Uh, there's a lot more rich stuff in uh, Patricia's book, and I welcome you all to take a look at it. And thank you very much for attending this event at the Center for Jewish Studies.